welcome to All the F Words. A podcast where two writer friends nearly 30 years apart explore everything we give an F about. I'm Gabby Moskowitz. And I'm Joanne Green. On each episode of All the F Words, we'll focus on a theme starting with the letter F. Things like fantasy, flirting, forgetting, and fetus. We'll share stories from our lives and our distinct generational perspectives and look to the experts for insights and ideas. Today we're talking about firearms, from the Second Amendment to our nation's obsession with guns. We will try to shed light on why it seems nearly impossible to pass any laws regulating background checks or banning assault weapons. And we'll speculate on what can be done when we learn of yet another tragic mass shooting beyond just sharing thoughts and prayers. This is the third week in a row, Joanne, where events have prompted us to focus on an F word that makes us want to tear our hair out. So true, Gabby. We devoted an episode to the word fetus and the leaked Supreme Court decision that threatens to overturn Roe v. Wade. And when then we talked about formula, as in infant formula, that has become so scarce that parents are finding themselves in crisis trying to provide for their babies. And this week it's firearms. As we all, without exception, no matter our political beliefs, collectively grieve for the children and their teachers in Uvalde, Texas, who were brutally murdered in their classrooms by an 18-year-old armed to the teeth with weapons that he had legally purchased. And I should add that since you wrote this script, there has been another shooting at a hospital in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And by now, we've all seen some version of the chart that shows that other countries with maybe one or two mass shootings, and then the United States with over 200 mass shootings so far this year, and the year is young. The question on everyone's lips is why? And really, there's a very simple answer, and it is our F word for today. It's firearms. The U.S. has 270 million guns, and from 1966 to 2012, had 90 different mass shooters. No other country has more than 46 million guns or 18 mass shooters. So we hear over and over again from gun rights activists, and boy, I was listening to the New York Times Daily podcast this morning and hearing it yet again from a couple of Republican members of Congress, guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, they might attribute Uh, the prevalence of mass shootings to our lack of good mental health care, which is true. We do have a lack of good mental health care and access across the board or to our racial divide, which, again, is true. But the fact is research consistently points to the number of guns and the ease with which guns can be purchased as the number one culprit for why we are. I'm going to be bold here and say sacrificing our citizens and now our children to this crazy demand obsession that we have a right to bear arms. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Well, especially because that line, the right to bear arms and the Second Amendment was written at a time and, you know, I mean, don't even get me started on the sort of craziness that I uh, think that um, it is that we, so many people insist that everything written by um, slave owning men a long, long, long time ago, slave owning white men. I was going to uh, add long, that. A long, long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, has to go um, unquestioned, like in perpetuity. I think that's its own issue. But it, Specifically in this in in this instance, as far as the Second Amendment goes, the, they were not talking about multiple magazine round machine guns. Um, they were talking about like pistols that took a really long time to load. And that ugh, I mean, you know, I'm not a big fan of guns in general, but I also acknowledge that there's a lot I don't understand about them. But It does seem to me that you can't apply the same logic to a machine gun as you can to, you know, something that that has fewer bullets. The word regulated appeared back then, right, Mm -hmm. in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was – I don't think our forefathers, you know, 
whatever their makeup was, ever envisioned the broad availability, the lack of training. You know, I was listening to something yesterday, a podcast actually that you turned me on to. What is it called? The Last Day? It's called Last Day. Yeah, it's great. Last Day. We will have to add it to the show notes. And it talked about comparing what we put people through to be able to drive a car, a vehicle on the road, which granted does have the power to kill people, but it also has a very different purpose to get you from point A to point B. And that is that we require you to be trained. We require you to be licensed and we require you to be insured. We require Mm -hmm. none of that for the right to bear an assault weapon. I mean, it it's insane. All right. I've got so much research for this episode. Let me start by talking about a study that was done by a professor at the University of Alabama in 2015 uh, named Adam Lankford. The rate of gun ownership in a country, he was able to prove, correlates with the odds of it experiencing a mass shooting. So in other words, fewer guns, fewer mass shootings. Only 4% of American gun deaths could be attributed to mental health issues. That even shocked me. Mm -hmm. I would have thought it would be much higher Mm -hmm. because I can't imagine what what would be another reason. But these are gun deaths broadly. So Mm -hmm. America's gun homicide rate in 2009 was 33 per million people. Listen listen to what it was in Canada and Britain. Canada, five per million. Britain, 0.7 per million. Oh my and, God. And those wow. numbers correspond with the differences in gun ownership. Here's one that knocked my socks off. A New Yorker is just as likely to be robbed as a Londoner but the New Yorker is 54 times more likely to be killed in the process. According to a, uh, yeah, I mean, I really almost need to give you a few beats, you and our listeners, to absorb (laughs) these, these little factoids. According to a recent analysis of 130 different studies from 10 countries, gun legislation reduces gun murders. End of story. In 2013, American gun-related deaths included uh, upwards of 21,000 suicides, so that's by far the highest number. And there are studies that show that if there is a waiting period between the time that a person tries to get a gun and actually gets the gun, they may be in a very different um, headspace and Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. use it Because they have time to think about it. Right. Or just- Time is our friend in these circumstances. Impulsivity is not. In that same period in 2013, just upwards of 11,000 homicides and 505 deaths by an accidental discharge. Let's look at Japan for that same year. Granted, they have one third of America's population. Guns were involved in a grand total of 13 deaths. I mean, God, I mean, even if you adjust for the the difference in population, it's still, it still is stunning, not even comparable. And what it means, I mean, I can't do the math this fast in my head or maybe even on paper, but somebody did. An American is about 300 times more likely to got to die by gun homicide or accident than a Japanese person. America's gun ownership rate is 150 times as high as Japan's. So even just looking at those two, our gun ownership rate is 150 times greater, but our the odds of us dying by gun homicide is 300 times more. Where does this idea that we have an inherent right to own a gun come from? Do you know which countries in the world preserve that right for their residents? Uh, I think... Um, Mexico, correct? Yes. And do you know, yes, Mexico and also Guatemala and the United right, States. Okay. And that's it. And that's because Mexico and Guatemala modeled their constitutions after ours. Oh, wow. The fact <sighs> that we have not behaved like people everywhere else in the world, where after a mass murder, stricter gun control laws 
are put into effect. That's what happened in Australia. That's what happened in Britain. This mm-hmm. is this is a post that a, a British journalist uh, had on Twitter a couple of years ago. I just think it's so profound. And of course, mm-hmm. he was referring when he says Sandy Hook. I'm sure that this is still in your mind, but I, I will remind you that it was the 2012 attack that killed 20 young students, primarily kindergartners at an elementary school in Connecticut, in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. He says, in retrospect, Sandy Hook marked the end of the U.S. gun control debate. Once America decided killing children was bearable, it was over. I I mean, as someone who does not think bear- <laughs> uh, killing children is bearable, it's, it's, it's such a difficult thing to, I mean, it's true. He's right. As a country, that is what we decided. And the, the news, the, the, the fight. One thing I really notice in myself is the fight I feel to suppress the desire. I have this, this inclination now with, with so much that happens in the news cycle, because I've got to get through my day and I've got to take care of my children and I've got to work and I've got to do everything that I've got to do. I have this urge I, whenever something terrible, and especially when something terrible involving a shooting that involves children comes up in the news cycle, I feel this urge to tune out. I don't want to know anything, but I, I also know that that is our ticket. Like inaction is so egregious. And I I have to find a way to, I make myself stay engaged and listen and learn their names. And I, it's the, the, the mental gymnastics, the mental and emotional gymnastics that I find myself going through. I, I can't even imagine. What Becoming parents, numb I, to this level of violence is the greatest danger of all, I think. I know. Yeah. Particularly for those of us privileged who don't see violence every day in our streets. Um, It's just too easy to live in our little bubbles and feel like this is a fight that can't be won. I don't buy it. Um, I don't believe it's a fight that can't be won. I believe it's a fight that must be won. And Mm -hmm. I believe we just, what's it going to take? That is the craziest thing of all. Another thing I learned in my research, Gabby, is that we don't have a really clear picture, most of us, on what creates a mass shooter. Um, Thankfully, there are people who do research on this and can um, shed some light on it for us. One being Jillian Peterson, who's an associate professor of criminology at Hamline University, and James Densley, a professor of criminal justice at Metro State University. They went uh, embarked on a study three years ago with funding from the National Institute of Justice, which is the research arm of the Justice Department. And they constructed a database of every mass shooter since 1966 who shot and killed four or more people in a public place. That, by the mm-hmm. way, is the definition of a mass shooting, four or more people killed in a public place. And they looked at every shooting incident at schools, workplaces, places of worship since 1999. So here's what they learned. Mass shooters study other mass shooters. They find someone who feels as I do, feels as they do. And that there is contagion to this behavior. So Uvalde followed Buffalo, not a huge surprise. Um, Often after an incident like what happened in Uvalde, I know here in our community in Nevada, California, the police were doing increased patrols around the schools. Mm -hmm. Made me sick, and yet I felt somewhat comforted. Mass shootings are both homicides and suicides. Mass shooters don't expect to survive. They just want to bring a whole lot of other people down with them. Hmm. Um, What I think we've all assumed, and rightfully so, is that early childhood uh, trauma has figured into this. It could be violence in the home, sexual assault, parental suicide, extreme bullying, all of that. 
which then leads to hopelessness and rejection and self-loathing, which leads to a crisis point, which for some people is suicide. We know that that is the greatest number of deaths by guns is suicide. Um, Or something like this, which often, and certainly in the case of these last three uh, mass shooters, adding in you know, the, the, the mass shooting of the doctor who performed the back surgery in, was it Oklahoma? The Uh, most recent one today? Mm -hmm. Tulsa. Um, There were clues. There were people who should have picked up the clues. There are some data-driven solutions that came out of this study by Peterson and Densley. One is people absolutely should safely store firearms. People should check in with their kids, see how they're they're going to have firearms. Yeah. Well, they should check in with their kids, period. You know, check in on them. Yeah, of course. They should safely store them. If they're going to have them, they should store them safely. They should store them. They should store them safely no matter what, right? No matter if there are kids or no kids. Um, There should be locks, right? These weapons should not be easily accessible to anybody. Um, People should check in with their kids, period. We should insist on having additional and good quality mental health resources at schools and other institutions. How about this one? Republicans who won't touch guns should support major funds for mental health. When I say won't touch guns, meaning won't won't in any way legislate guns, Mm -hmm. should absolutely be supporting major funds for mental health. And ideally, any solution should involve both gun gun control and preventative mental health. I mean, one of the things that it doesn't blow my mind, nothing blows my mind anymore, but that I I certainly think about all the time is is how many um, Republicans, uh, you know, tweet their thoughts and prayers and then accept so much money from the NRA. I mean, the the NRA has completely changed. They used to just be about, I don't, I don't really, um, I don't even really know what they used to be about, but I, what I know now is less that- mo- Less money and less power. Yes, for sure. That's true. I think that they have capitalized on this idea that Americans get every time there's a mass shooting or that- um, uh, those on the right get that uh, that that gun laws are going to get cracked down on, and they have tried tried to appeal to those who are um, serious about their guns in trying to get them to believe that the Democrats are going to come take their guns away, and it has almost created this political and cultural divide that I don't know was necessarily there to this extent before mass shootings became a regular thing. I would absolutely remove the word almost. I think it has created a divide. And you're absolutely right. Gun sales consistently um, peak. There's a spike in gun sales after every um, mass murder. And I, excuse me, I don't think it's because people are afraid that there's going to be a mass murder in their communities. I think it's because like you say, people are fearful that someone's going to come take their guns away. And it's, it's all capitalizing on fear. Um, Another thing that I learned yesterday in listening to the last day podcast was to really look at, and I've been able to see this over the course of my long life thus far, the unbelievable shift in the int- the way that society views something that you thought was impossible to legislate and then through a series of events and public service campaigns that bombard people with messages really craftily done um you can make a big shift i would not think of getting in a car without putting my seatbelt on it is automatic to me it is like saying bless you when someone sneezes truth i mean it is it is just an automatic gesture but in my childhood first of all there were no seatbelts and then once there were seatbelts you rarely used them and 
no one could have convinced me at that point that it would become so automatic, like saying, excuse me, after belching or something. I mean, it is that automatic. The other one is smoking. I don't know Mm, anyone who smokes cigarettes anymore. Now, I'm sure many people listening do, and I'm sure many of our listeners do, but it it has the the place that cigarette smoking held in our society 40 years ago and where it is today is drastically vastly different and i would argue that that's not exclusively or even mo- even mostly because of the research that's come out about it i don't think people are as convinced by research as they are by social pressure. You know, it's become corporations got behind the idea of of not smoking. Um, Not smoking became synonymous with health. Sure, it started with with research and and medical information. Well, it started with the Surgeon General's report, right? That's when it started. But it became cultural mainstream. It became... At least, at least in my circles, cooler not to smoke than to smoke. Smoking was started to be seen as kind of gross. But how did that happen? That's what I'm. That's what I want to say. It, and I contend that legislation played a role because first it was mandated that there be a warning on every pack of cigarettes. Then we, it was required that there be a certain amount of advertising time in the in the form of public service announcements devoted to this mm-hmm. then the advertising of cigarettes was regulated and banned from many places mm. right. so the reason we thought cigarettes were cool was that we were told that cigarettes were cool you know the marlboro man and we had menthol cigarettes and virginia slims and all of the that we were we had been bombarded with messages telling us that cigarettes were cool and smoking was cool. And then over time, we were bombarded with messages telling us that cigarettes can kill you. So what if we were bombarded with messages about guns? And again, cigarettes aren't illegal. They're not banned. They're regulated. We have been educated. What are the three E's? Engineering, uh, education, and hmm, it's not. I don't see, know. yeah, I count on you to have a memory. <laughs> it's that. It's that the estrogen. Three E's? Could we call it <laughs> estrogen? Could we call the third one estrogen? <laughs> no, uh, I'm only kidding. <laughs> oh, oh, enforcement, engineering, education, and enforcement. See, you do have a brain. No, I have access to Google. You have access to Google and and access to estrogen, both of which are um, gifts, let me just say. Thankfully, I have access to Google, too. (laughs) But yes, so when you think about that engineering, we need to work out a system, right? And Mm -hmm. guns need to be safer. Assault weapons need to be banned. Universal background checks, what, 90% of Americans are in favor of universal background checks? What the F? What the F? Yeah, that's right. And then education, yeah. over and over again, message, 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 message. Cool people don't carry guns. Guns don't make you any safer. That's just fact. Guns don't mm-hmm. make you any safer. Um, California is a is a big whopping example. If you consider the number of people that live in California and then look at the stats, you see that the gun control measures that have been enacted in this state have made us safer. It's incontrovertible. It's it's there. I actually think, though, that the main thing that will make a difference in this crisis is enforcement. I think that with enforcement will come, God willing, a collective cultural shift where we start, where we get education and we um, start shifting in general to uh, a belief that that guns are not cool and not good. Um, But I also think that people can think guns are cool all day long. Let's make them really hard to get. Let's make them hard to get. And let's, and if someone's going to get a gun now, I personally believe that the only guns that someone ought to buy should 
uh, well, said otherwise, I don't think that anyone should have access to a weapon of war. I think that's insane. But okay, let's say that we're not getting rid of everything. Let's just make it so that uh, uh, someone can't go to Walmart on their 18th birthday and buy a machine gun. Let's just start there because it's actually pretty complicated to get on the dark web and find um, a, a machine gun. I'm sure it can be done and I'm sure it has been done, but let's start with making it less easy. There are so many solutions, and thankfully, there are so many different nonprofit organizations working tirelessly on this. One of my favorites is the Brady Campaign. They have plans both for with the cooperation of Congress and without. So I, I urge people to go to their website and read more about it. We have included it in the show notes. The other thing that I wanted to mention real quickly is that we are becoming increasingly polarized in this country. And even when you think it can't get any worse, then it gets worse. So the thought that there's going to be some measure of gun control in blue states and the right to to an abortion, reproductive rights preserved in those same states, it, it starts to feel like we're living in two different countries. And terrifies me because what does that eventually lead to? A civil Some sort war. of civil war. Yeah. It's terrifying. It really is. And then we won't be armed. We in the blue states. It, and and I think even more simply, it makes the idea of I, I have found it so much harder to understand what my conservative counterparts are what they think and feel and are experiencing. And I I want it makes the idea of open dialogue so much harder to even conceive of. Right. And yet we must try. We must, we must continue to try and we must continue to insist that our media outlets give us more than just one viewpoint, even though they're no longer mandated any longer. Um, but let's leave our audience today, Gabby, with some things you can do and really Obviously, you can donate money to nonprofits that are in need of money because that's what it takes. It takes money to move the needle flat out. Reach out to your legislation legislators. Let them know how you feel. Hold your vote hostage. Someone uh, suggested the other day that what if some significant number of professional athletes just refused to play? And said, you know what? Until there's meaningful gun control legislation in this country, and until HR 8, universal background checks, is passed, it's been sitting there in the Senate growing mold for two years while Republican senators hold it hostage. There are 50 senators who, who need to move on that. What if, what if the NBA just said, nope, we're not going to do the playoffs? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's going to happen right away, but. Mm -hmm. What's it going to take? That would be great. I think that, uh, I think like in, like so many, um, in so many of these big issues plaguing us that so often, I don't mean, I don't mean to sound, uh, you know, like a crazy, super far left wacko, but I think capitalism and money is really, it's like, until until we can choose people over money, I think it's going to be hard to make any change. You crazy left wing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm okay with that. I don't know. I always thought, you know, when when people hurl the phrase "social justice warrior" like that's some sort of bad thing. I'm kind of like, I don't know. I don't really mind the idea of being thought of as a warrior for social justice. I think that sounds pretty cool. I'd wear a T-shirt that says that. Yeah, let's make them. Thanks so much for listening to all the F words today. We would love to hear from you. If you disagree with us on anything, please write to us at all the F words pod at gmail.com and follow us on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at all the F words pod. And we'd love to hear from you. You can still send your thoughts and prayers, but act. Inaction is the enemy. Inaction is the enemy.